Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the OSINT Curious Webcast podcast. I am Michael Hoffman, and I am thrilled to have a full house, virtual house, of course, um, of socially distant OSINT Curious members that are assisting me in this webcast this week. Also, we have a great studio audience that's geographically dispersed, so not really in studio, but they're along with us, and we are thrilled that you're listening to us on whatever platform you're on. And we are absolutely thrilled to have a special guest that we're going to be interviewing in just a moment. But before we do, we need to tell you who's here. So I'm going to go ahead and hand this off. Nick's Intel, why don't you go ahead and say hi to everybody? Hi, everybody. Really glad you could join us for the live webcast or if you're catching up later on the podcast. Um, Really great to be here. I'm really looking forward to tonight's show. And so next, I'm going to point at Ritu. Say hi, Ritu. Hey, everyone. It's uh, Ritu here. Uh, OSINT Techniques on Twitter. I'm excited for the show. This is uh, the last one until September. Uh, And I'm excited that everyone uh, came out. Thank you. Ritu, who do you want to call to be next? Uh, let's do um, LaRond. Wait, LaRond's this- last. Oh, gotta be oh, last. He, oh he, yes. Oh, sorry. He's special. Uh, Nico. <laughs> there you go. Buddy, uh, not LaRond. You have to do it with Ooh, me. Oh, you're very quiet, buddy. Sorry? Can't hear you. You can't hear me? Nope. I think whatever uh, sector had is contagious. <laughs> <laughs> You know you should be able to hear me. Yeah. No, it's worse. You can't hear no. me. No. <laughs> That's better. Yeah. So go. hi, Nico, the chosen guy here, and I'm passing the mic to Matthias. Hey, this is Matthias, also known as MW OSINT on Twitter, and really excited for our last episode before our summer break. Cool. Matthias, who do you want to call? I guess you gotta to go to Sector. Oh yeah, I'll go to Sector, yeah. Hi, everyone. Sector here after being away for a bit. Welcome, everybody. And so who is left? Laurent Bodo. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Laurent, and I have the honor to um, introduce our special guest today. Um, so Ines Narciso, thank you so much for joining us on today's show. Mm-hmm. And uh, just to explain to you who Ines is and what she has been doing, Um, Let me quickly introduce you uh, to her. So Ines worked in the Portuguese intelligence service for 12 years. And she kind of like started OSINT uh, in 2008 and also became an OSINT and online undercover operations project manager. In 2019, she then also joined the ISTE uh, Lisbon University, where she teaches at the moment digital methods and also does research on uh, disinformation, something we will also talk about later. And then since then, she's also built a company that uses open source intelligence to find people's ancestors and build family trees. So something very interesting. And I think we will also talk about this. And in her spare time, she also helps pro bono fellow journalists in Portugal and abroad in their investigations and women who have been a victim of revenge porn or intimate image abuse. So Ines, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. As I told you before, I mean, I've been following you, most of you for quite a lot of years. And as you must be aware in my previous job, I mean, you can't possibly reach out, but it's always been an honor to see the OSINT community develop. Since I've been doing this for quite a while by now, um, since 2008, I actually could see the OSINT community Uh, actually appear and starting like the start of the hashtag and people starting to talk about it on Twitter and it from the start it was such an amazing community to be part of because everyone was sharing and everyone was super nice and I mean from the start I felt okay I can't reach out but I'm so happy I'm part of this and for me to be here today is like quite an honor thank you so much yeah, absolutely welcome. Let me just start with the first question. So tell us your story. How did you get into OSINT? Well, uh, I joined the Portuguese Intelligence Service in 2007 and I started wa- working in organized crime as an analyst and I was quite young. I just finished my master's in criminology. I studied in the UK and in, in Leicester um, because I knew from an from quite early that I wanted to do like investigation research 
Um, and that's when I discovered High Five. So those were like the good old days where everyone was like sharing everything. Uh, and it was quite interesting for me to find out that there were quite a lot of people involved in some really bad things that weren't like actually very shy on like taking photos with weapons and drugs and money. <laughs> Uh, so that's where when I started and at that point it was not that known about I mean between my colleagues of course they had some knowledge but I kind of like took it as a project of my own and after after like one or two years in the desk I was invited to join like the best team that was involved with undercover operations and everything you dream of when you want to like join this world right and so that's what I did and I worked there for 12 years it was amazing I learned a lot I worked with the best people in the world I, I didn't leave like disgruntled I just left because I needed some time for my family and to do new things like talking with you guys um, but actually there we developed actually a unit that would work like OSINT on a more professional level and also with a line of um, undercover operations online which has a lot to do with OSIN and OSIN skills are quite useful there as well. And so that's what I did for quite a while. I can't tell you a lot about it, but it was really, really good. And then in 2019, after my second child was born, I decided I wanted to like kind of slow down and help my parents. And so I went to university to finish my PhD and as the person that I am that can't stay put, <laughs> I got involved in doing research on this information and then one thing led to another and now I'm like, I built this company and now I'm again <laughs> working way too long and for way too many hours, but that's kind of like a proof that the problem wasn't in my previous job, it was just with me. <laughs> Absolutely. Can I also quickly ask you, how do you see has the OSIN community evolved? Because you talked about it earlier uh, in 2008 and 2009. Was there a community or how was it there when you were trying to exchange information or learn from others? What were you doing? Well, at that point, I guess the biggest person was Arno that we all kind of know, right? And well, I mean, at least I trained with him and he was like the godfather. So he was one of the first, I think, to like except for law enforcement to share like links and to start to talk about OSINT um, more openly. And I definitely remember the change that came with Bellingcat. So especially to explain to people about what I did and about my work and to explain how important it was, I think the MH17 like made a huge difference. And also, to people who are in a deciding position, so that like directors, managers, when you can't always explain to them how useful this is and how it can make a difference with such a low risk and without invading any privacy, just you know, going through things that are public. And I think Bellingcat was also like a huge jump uh, forward. And I think since then it's been growing ever since, and then you guys appeared and then I mean, basically, but I think from the start, it started really well. So it started with the right attitude of like sharing and talking with each other and sharing tools. It was never actually a, a, a closed community or something. And I think that's why it thrived so much because people were very open from the start because probably if people had kept it for themselves, it wouldn't have been the community that it is today. So um, one of the things that I, I know about you is that you just gave a talk uh, at Layer 8, right, yeah. on disinformation in the Portuguese elections. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And, you know, there are other elections that are coming up in, in recent months or in, in the upcoming months. Um, do, does what you found uh, maybe, port, um, does it carry over to the, or can it carry over to other uh, countries? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, we used uh, quite a lot of tools, including CrowdTangle that we were talking about, to um, 
try to extract the most viral posts regarding politics. So we were only looking at political posts. And then we would fact check like the top 20 of each week, um, one by one. And we found out after four weeks that actually two thirds of the content was like either like disinformative or misleading. So it could disinform. Um, and one of the things that stood out afterwards when I went to do the same work in Amsterdam in January with uh, anti-European Union discourse is that actually the techniques are quite the same. So you can apply them everywhere. And we developed, we, we tried to use the most well-known system, like um, system to um, organize this information, which is the Claire Wardle, the first draft news system, which I think a lot of us know, but we didn't manage to, to be like, have consensus while applying it, especially due to intent, because it's quite difficult as a researcher to see a post and to think about what the intent of the person was. So we ended up kind of like developing a parallel system of tags and tags were not about intent or they were more about the characteristics. So me coming from an OSINT perspective, I was quite interested on how was it possible that this disinformed? Why was it? Was it because of the image that actually didn't portray uh, what was on the text? Was it about time? So for example, you can share some old news about the government is going to raise electricity bills and actually it's from the New York Times and it's completely accurate, but it's from 2012. And then you share it in a Facebook group and you go like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. And not a lot of people are gonna click on the link and see that it's like old news. So, and especially with COVID, we're seeing that quite a lot with the masks issue, like people resharing like speeches and videos of people from uh, the World Health Organization in January saying, yeah, no, ma masks are not mandatory. And then you just pick that up and you reshare it now. And it looks like it doesn't add up, but actually it does. So it was quite interesting to see these different techniques being used. And yeah, I think it, it, it's really important that we as an OSINT community kind of help researchers who are working on this area to not only fact check, because that's one of the biggest differences I felt in the work we did, but also uh, identify sharing patterns. Where did this first appeared? When, who was the first people who shared it? How did it grow? Are there any fake profiles or bots that are sharing this in a not natural way? And all those kind, all that kind of things that we're used to doing in our everyday life. I think one of the, the challenges, I, at least I have today, and you all tell me if you have this too, is that it seems like on social media and over here in the United States, even in our mainstream media, I, the consumer, have to fact check everything. Stuff's being printed without being fact checked. Some, stuff is being presented on TV and, and other mainstream media with, that is blatantly wrong, incorrect, disinformative. And I'm just getting overwhelmed with the, I have to fact check everything and therefore I fact check nothing, but I don't trust anything. Is that, I mean, I guess that's apathy. I don't know if it happens to you all. Doesn't it all also have to do with the fact that now that we are all more aware of the, the term fake news, that we are, that we became more aware of that there could be fake news around us. So now we are being um, made aware and the, uh, paranoid about the news or skeptic about the news more? I think there's a lot more disinformation go yeah. around, not because there's more bad guys, but also because of the speed of things. So one of the main things that changed in the past four years, and I'm working in a lab that's full with journalists, is the process how um, news centers produce news. And now there's such a pressure to be like the first and to get the news out and you have to post every day 10 different things. And it, of course, like when you get to that speed, it's inevitable that you make mistakes. That's one of the reasons. The second thing is, I think I always say this and people, I don't understand why don't, why everybody doesn't know how to do OSINT. For me, like, this would be like mandatory. I mean, my kids are learning about 
I don't know how many the name parts of a plant and of course it's important but actually this is so useful in my life for everything from symptoms that my kid has because he's sick from I have to search for a job I have to search for a house I get always like the best vacation deals the best house deals I mean everyone goes how do you get those deals and I was like yeah I I can Google. <laughs> yeah. So it's like this, this is one of the main things that I would say that's the, one of the best to tackle this information. Another thing that we've been discussing quite a lot at our research lab, and I'm sure that people from IT will understand this better than me, is that we have this feeling that platforms and fact-checking platforms are fact-checking post by post. And they're not using a lot of AI to identify what we call narratives. So the issue is, once you have a narrative that you've found and that's like connected to a lot of this information, let's What's say- What's a narrative? What, what would you define? How would you define a narrative? Like, like vaccines a, are dangerous. Okay. Or 5G causes health problems. Okay. okay. These it are it does, doesn't it? We've had that discussion <laughs> before. <laughs> Matthias. <laughs> So away exactly. from the tower. But you'd be surprised of how many people with like high education and that you would think that would not fall for it. I felt for disinformation myself. I mean, you can't fact check everything. So the main issue is they're going post by post. And once you do that, it becomes impossible to like get everything. And one of the things that we feel is that if you, once you've identified the narrative, and we did this for the Portuguese elections, there was one narrative that said our prime minister went on vacation during the big forest fires. And we got up some keywords and we went through them on Twitter using like Twint and CrowdTangle, like on Facebook and a lot of different tools because we tried to use different ones, even Google. And actually, after a day, we had about 1,500 posts that have this false narrative. And after you've identified them, it's like a question of one or two seconds to identify that they're disinformative. And I think that most fact-checking platforms are not like cooperating and the platforms there themselves are not working on a narrative base. They're working on, is this post true or not? Is this one true or not? And they're not going like, okay, I want to see every post on Facebook that has the word vaccines and, for example, I don't know, death or um, consequences or like uh, complications. Or, and then it would be probably easy for an AI machine to already do like a lot of the work and then just one person really quick fact checking what the machine had done. Hmm. But we are not seeing this actually. Yeah, I think you essentially go by topic instead of post by post by post. Yeah. I'm sorry, Nick, I interrupted. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm interested about what you said um, about this, why doesn't everyone learn OSINT and the need to train and develop people's skills. And you mentioned a bit about um, in your intelligence service days, you sort of developed and professionalized um, the OSINT world there. Can you tell us how you think... Um, or what the best way is to train and professionalize the way people do OSINT, uh, be that in journalism or elsewhere? How do people improve their skills? Well, I mean, it depends on your goal. Um, I would say that one of the basic issues is that people have to use the tools and on an everyday basis. And I would start with simply Google. Okay, or like really small things about how internet works. So what's a website? What's a URL? Uh, when you're going into a URL, is there a search box? How are websites built? They have pages. Um, are they, what's the difference between like indexed web and non-indexed web? I mean, and this is like small things, but I think a 10 year old should know that some things like, for example, what's on Instagram or Facebook mostly is on Google. So these are like, what's, what's a web crawler? And I'm not from IT, I mean, I don't know a lot about a camp program or anything, but these small things make quite a lot of difference. When I speak to my friends who are like searching for something and they're like, I saw an ad and it's gone. I was like, have you seen if it, there's a cached view? And they're like, what? And this is like basic skills for everyday life. And one of the things I've felt like since I, I left 
my, my previous job, some people asked me, do you want to go back or do you want to like build your own company? And I, on like Ozen, and I always tell people that you can use it for anything. Like if you're a trader, if you are, for example, in a company and you want to monitor like your company or just know what people are saying about you, or I give one of the courses we give at uni is a, a political advising. So I teach them how to tackle this information regarding political advising. But actually the course is mo much more about if you're like helping PR a, politic a, a, a politician, how do you know what people are saying about him? And how do you pinpoint if something's not accurate? And how do you build like the counter narrative to try to show people that what's being said is actually not true? And it's quite the basic skills and you'd be surprised of how many people are like, are going to be PR of a politician, but they don't really know how Facebook works or they don't really know how Instagram works or how hashtags work. So I would say start with the basics about how internet works and actually OSINT is, it looks like such a complicated word, but it's just so simple about you have this tool that's internet that has so much information and we're just losing it because we don't know how to find it. And it's kind of like wanting kids to read without ever teaching them what's a book and what's like a chapter and what's, how do you find which page the information is, what's the index. And we teach that, but we don't teach that about internet. Well, it's almost like there's a branding issue. You know, we say OSINT, 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 and people are like, what is OSINT? And we're like, it's what you really do, but we just put a nice little, you know, uh, words behind it. We put open yeah. source intelligence and they're like, well, is that Googling? Yeah, it's kind of Googling, but we, we use other commands and, and other searches as well. I, I think that, you know, as we think more about OSINT versus just teaching people how to get better at finding information and truthful information and accurate information online, there is going to be this, this war of, well, that's OSINT, but this is just teaching normal skills. And we do need those skills. We need, you know, every, every industry that I've talked to, whether it's recruiting and sourcing or whether it's brand management or, or just business and stuff, everybody's doing research online and could benefit from OSINT in general. And it also kind of applies to privacy. So this is one of the things I've not seen like the OSINT community develop a lot, but I did it quite a lot in my previous work, which was people think a lot about privacy and like, oh, especially with law enforcement, they tell you, ah, you shouldn't have like a personal profile. And I always tell to people like the best way to defend yourself is to know what's out there. So actually what we were teaching like our staff was how do you OSINT yourself? How do you see what's about, about yourself out there? Because probably you think there's nothing, but maybe your cousin is just like posting entire life on Instagram or something like that. And it's quite interesting to see that when people do like vet themselves, they're much more aware of like privacy issues and what's dangerous and what isn't and that they don't need to like delete, delete, delete. They just have to be more aware of if I Google my name or if I do two or three like searches for a username, what does pop up? So I think that's one of the main skills that we can teach people is like if they know how to search for themselves, they're also more aware if what kind of things there about them are out there that, that, that shouldn't be so. Yeah. So speaking of the, the, the different sources that you mentioned in your project before and, and now when OSINTing yourself, you talked about Facebook, Instagram. Um, are there any social media platforms that are um, just in Portugal or the Portuguese speaking countries? Um, is there anything that sticks out there or do you guys just run along with everything that we all have, Instagram, Facebook and stuff like that? No, it's Twitter is quite small in Portugal, Reddit as well. Facebook is really, really big. Uh, Instagram is growing. I think it's kind of the same. What really concerns us right now at my uni project and also as um, being against revenge porn and uh, intimate um, image abuse is WhatsApp. And what we've been seeing is actually the a huge growth of WhatsApp. Um, for COVID-19, for example, we didn't see it in the elections, but for COVID-19, we saw this 
I mean, this, it was a wave of disinformation in the first five days that you have no idea, and especially in audio format. And for us, it was quite interesting because it's actually a format that isn't used in other platforms. And why was this being so popular? And for us as researchers, it was quite the idea of, first, it was very personal. So it wasn't like a text message because you could hear the doctor like crying and saying, you know, the government is hiding the dead bodies and there are, oh, there's so many. And well, a lot of things like that. So they were really emotional people. They were very believable. People believed in them. But on the other hand, because it's not a video, you keep your identity quite protected because a voice is like harder to recognize and to be sure about who the person was. And WhatsApp has an issue because it doesn't control content and you can't remove it. So regarding, for example, revenge porn, I mean, I talk with some of the people that come and ask me for help and we manage to get it out of porn too and like all those platforms and we get a lawyer involved. But then it always goes back because it's on WhatsApp. <laughs> and there's this guy that's going through his Google photos. And then after two years, like, oh, this video, I'm going to share it back again. And then it's way back again. So that's one of the issues I think as a community we should start talking about with extreme right, violent content, racist content, uh, sexual content. I mean, there's no, there's nobody controlling it. And sometimes when people ask me about elections, for example, I say that if someone wants to do a really good deep fake on a politician and ran it like with like child molesting or something that would be like really like scary and they want to share it on WhatsApp and if they do it like one day before the elections you may have like a huge problem and not even be aware of it until it's like too late so, so who whose responsibility do you feel it is to help monitor control decrease this is it obviously it's our responsibility as as consumers to not share knowingly false or unresearched information but do you feel like WhatsApp and Facebook, the platform, should be looking at WhatsApp, seeing what's in there, monitoring, filtering it, or should it just be the government? Or I mean, because that's the biggest problem is, hey, WhatsApp isn't just an app on 10 people's phones. It's on millions of, of yeah. devices. And who, who should be responsible for doing that? I think it's a, it's a difficult discussion. We have it a lot also at uni about should they remove content for example, on, on social media platforms. But I think one of the things that we need to talk, start is talking about it. So at least that step of assuming we have an issue of like, I mean, excessive sharing of porn that nobody's checking who it's from. I mean, it's not like a website that's liable and that, that if there's a problem and if they're putting like content with children or with people that didn't consent to that, that it's going to be removed and platforms will be liable. I think we need to start talking about it. And I'm not sure on a technical perspective what could be done, but I think they've been doing something. So here in Portugal, at least that you can't forward content anymore after this COVID-19 at the same rate. So that was important. And I would say you could maybe, maybe even if everything remains encrypted, if each media content has a sort of a hash, at least they can like know where, how big it is and maybe like put a warning or something that like this hash contains an appropriate or whatever content or something. I mean, even if they don't know what it is but if you can go with a video and say look this video has been being shared in whatsapp this is the hash could you please like just so do, do a capture first or something yeah you see the con i have, I have one question uh, related to for instance the whatsapp for me being a closed or, or more like closed ecosystem and we just talked about disinformation and things shifting uh, a little bit to uh, on a larger scale but also from osin from nosen perspective um, well, the word says it, open source intelligence. Um, how, what are your opinions when it comes to that shifting landscape? Because a lot of techniques to get into those platforms um, are certainly not open source intelligence in my book. They're more like human to get in or other techniques to get into that group or subpoena or something like that. What's your opinion about that? Yeah, I think we, we're seeing like an increased awareness on people regarding their privacy. And I mean, that, that's 
that's good. Um, I think it's going to be a challenge for the OSINT community as it starts to grow. But as always, I think we're also very creative and <laughs> I'm sure that some way we'll find of getting information somewhere else. Um, one of the things that we tried at our, um, at our research lab was crowd uh, sourcing. So actually with COVID-19, what we did was we asked people to forward for our WhatsApp account what they considered to be this information. And it was quite interesting to see how much uh, people would share. And we got a couple of thousand messages in the first week. It was like really, really big. We were having trouble keeping up with it and thanking everyone. Uh, so I guess that will be one of the things you will be dependent on actually people eventually resharing. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw, I think it, I'm not sure if it was Matthias. I, I know someone in Germany, I don't know if it was Unix Intel was sharing an article about how the German police got into someone's WhatsApp by... Oh, yeah, it was me. Yeah, it was you? Okay, cool. Yeah. So, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think social engineering, especially for, like, law enforcement, and I've, I've been on the other side, that's one of the things that we as Portuguese kind of were proud of ourselves because the Portuguese intelligence service has no rights. I mean, if you want to Google it, you can see it. We can't tap phones. We can't tap anything. We can't, we can't do anything. We couldn't. Well, they can't anymore. And actually, when you can't do anything, you become very creative on the ways you, you have to get the data that you still need. So then you count on like social engineering techniques. So I guess that that's one probably going to be one of the step forward, like using those kinds of techniques to get eventually like the information that you need um, from those kinds of platforms. So it becomes shifts more to like online investigative work, yes. and similar yeah. to online journalism, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So um, I think looking at the time, we need to go to the news, right, Micah? So one well, last you, question. You have one more question, don't yeah, you, I, Dutch? Um, what within the open source intelligence field is something that you have never come to but really want to learn? That I've never? Come to learn, but you really want to, to What's learn. something you're here? looking to learn yeah. in OSINT? You know everything, don't you? Darn it, we finally met somebody. No, I know. I'm thinking. I remember there was a time where I, I thought I wanted to learn Python, okay? Like in 2011, 12, there was this, I think it was Black Hat thing for using Python with Maltigo, and I used Maltigo quite a lot, and I really wanted to, like, make it more personalized, and I was like, I'm going to learn it, but then I quit. <laughs> then I thought, okay, I can, and then I just, like, okay, I'll just stick to my old, like, my mind, my brain, and that should be enough, and yeah. Basically that, I mean, I'm sure there's things I don't know and I'm always learning and that's the amazing part of this community is that you learn every day. Uh, I remember when Sector first published about the Google IDs, I was like, darn it, why didn't I think about that? I mean, um, and actually you learn every day. So I guess I, that's what I would like to keep is this like curiosity and this desire to like learn every day and to stay like, hmm, what's this? Okay, let's, and then go down the rabbit hole and. It was an entire afternoon. <laughs> that happens, right? That happens a lot more than we, we think. I, I find myself, I mean, being OSINT curious or just being curious about the world and how things work um, is, is always very uh, intriguing to me. And I find myself getting so distracted by things. I have a list like this big of, hey, I want to learn about that. Ooh, cryptocurrency, Mon Monero, that sounds great. And, you know, I get a little bit in, I'm like, okay. Oh, look, something else over there. Um, there's so many things to learn. Uh, I just, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Um, and for those of you that don't know Inez's uh, Twitter handle, it is IWN underscore LX. Here is a picture of it on the screen. So, yeah. uh, Actually, just to, to finish up, Mark, yeah, please. You know probably a lot of people are, uh, thinking also about that, I recently built a genealogy company and right. actually I think one of the areas that's quite unexplored and I didn't know it myself, I just learned about it now because of the new company is actually uh, like ancestry websites. There's a lot of OSINT to 
to gather from Ancestry websites. So keep an eye on that because I think it's like kind of uncharted field. I know there was like a couple of years ago in a conference, someone did one talk about that, I think like four or five years ago, but that's it. So that would be an interesting thing to start digging on. Yeah, Thank definitely. you for having me. Well, we look forward to you sticking around and you know, we're gonna be talking about a bunch of news in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, please let us know what you think about what you think about all of that. And thank you so much for sharing your life and experience and thoughts with us. Um, really, thank you. All right, well, let's uh, head on over to the news. And this week we do have uh, some new contributors. Um, let me go ahead and take a look here because I have some extra names. So in addition to block int and jca3s we've got leonard carlos hans and stefan thank you so much for being our patrons this month and like uh some people said at the beginning um we are going to be taking a break in august to focus on our families and focus on some other content so uh this is our last bunch of news and when we come back we've got a whole month of news to go through all right I think, Matthias, you were the one that brought this image cloaking up. Is that right? That is correct. Uh, so Tell us about it. The whole topic, facial recognition, ha has been on our webcast for the past couple episodes. Um, basically, every episode we have something new. And here I, I found a nice research project uh, from the University of Chicago where they basically did uh, very small adjustments to images, to images of, of faces, um, like just, you know, um, adding small additions to the pixels, which would render facial recognition kind of useless. And uh, this to me is interesting for a couple reasons. Well, first of all, for, for your own personal security, uh, your own OPSEC. So if you have images that you've posted somewhere, um, you might want to try using this tool um, to make facial recognition from PIM eyes or other tools like that not work. And of course, the same thing could be done for uh, your sock puppets. So if you do pull a, a, a generic image from stock photos or you, you have an image created with this person does not exist, you might be able to combine that with Fox um, to make it harder to actually detect. And um, something I haven't tested it yet, um, but I, I will be doing that the next couple of weeks. And as we've had the past couple of episodes, just a lot of new stuff coming out that we can combine with other tools and methods um, for our own OPSEC, PERSEC, or also for the sock puppets. Would be interesting for me to see if they put certain pixels at specific places, because then it would be really easy to tackle the software Fox itself, right? Yep. But well, in, in they, theory, specifically, they specifically talk about in the article that it, it, if somebody uses machine learning to learn about the, your face and what the geometry is and all that, then these, these in, not invisible, but these little changes are going to mess that up so that if they do try to match your face with other things, it's just not going to match. Um, but that's kind of neat. What were you going to say, Matthias? And I've seen this work in, in other uh, cases. So I, I was working on a project where it was also about image recognition, just not on, on faces, um, where we manipulated images in, in that way. And it, it did kind of work. Um, so I'm pretty confident that also this project um, will work for, for the images that we upload ourselves or our faces. So I'll try that out pretty soon. Maybe I have something to report in September. Awesome. All right, Nico. You were a person that tweeted up and uh, tweeted out about PDVid. Yeah, I, I just literally stumbled upon it, and I was like, "This is really interesting because it searches within over seventy uh, video sources for videos. So, uh, so now you don't have to do it all manually. So basically, it's like the what's my name for a, a application for, but then for videos, pretty cool. But I got to be honest, when it looks for um. Uh, specific stuff it isn't that rich yet but they recently start it's not that old but I've already found especially I was well my background is in counterterrorism, so I um, went looking for those kind of videos because I knew they once were up for instance and now almost everyone took them down but I still was able to pull up some of those videos so um, yeah just another tool to fill in your toolbox Nice. And it makes a cat sound when you do this yeah. search. 
Yes. Yeah, that, that freaked me out because my cat was sitting right next to me. I'm like, what did I do? But it's the website. So thank, thanks for that, Nico. All right. And Matthias, I think you uh, did this crowd tracking, map checking, crowd size estimating site. Tell us about it. I think this has been around for quite a while. A lot of us know this already, uh, but especially with, with the recent events happening all over the place um, where you have crowds gathering together, um, a lot of times it's, it's interesting to actually verify the amount of people that could have been in that crowd. And that's what this basically does. Um, so you can, you can draw an outline of an area um, and then you can basically define the, the, what you think the density of the crowd is and, and this will actually calculate how many people were likely there. Um, so really interesting if you have imagery of, of larger crowds, you've geolocated the area to kind of figure out how many people could possibly be there. That's really neat. So how do you get 2.3 people per square meter? I mean, so if you click on that link, what does it look like? It will um, uh, lead you to right under the, the little there it'll lead you to another document that tells you a bit more on crowd density and it gets That's into really that. Neat. Yeah. So you have to do some research. You have to read into it, but here you see images, you know, where they say this is 1.5 square people per square meter. And, and that might be something you can work with. That is cool. Yeah. So we're not actually getting like two thirds of a person or anything like that, where it's, it's rough estimation and all based upon, yeah. it looks like gaps between people, right? Here, hold my head. Yeah, cool. All right, what about security trails? Matthias, I think you again brought up this great article about security trails offering these OSINT kind of uh, uh, blog posts, but Twitter thread-like things. Yeah, I saw that. I, I don't know how long they have been doing this, but I just saw that when I was checking for content uh, yesterday. And I, I saw that this company, Security Trails, was looking into other companies um, and, and just going through kind of like a very rough OSINT investigation, looking into the domains, the subdomains, uh, email addresses that can be found. And it's just, if you look at these threads, it's a really nice walkthrough through, through some of the things you can do with, with tools that are out there. Um, and I just thought, you know, for, for beginners, for example, if you're getting into domain research, um, it's just really nice to go through this and, and see what you can find. Um, so something that I, I just want to point out, you know, have a look at those threads. There are a couple out there and that might help you get some ideas on what else you can look into when you're researching a company or a domain. Yeah. And, and it looks like, I mean, they, they are, it looks like they are using d domain name uh, information and things that you might find on their site as well. But, you know, securitytrails.com is, is a mostly free site, or you can register for a free account, and it has some pretty good information in there as well. Thanks, Matthias. Now, uh, Ritu, were you the one that posted this uh, for us to talk about, uh, how uh, Amanda Agarwal talked about adding the filter colon verified to their tweets? Yeah, it's, uh, so his, I, I, I just noticed he had posted that and uh, I thought it was kind of neat because um, it's a blog post, I believe from 2019, but he just kind of uh, tagged that, but I thought it was good because if you're looking for content from verified accounts, you know, the blue check mark, um, so if we want to do, you know, filter, uh, or sorry, what you've done, filter verified COVID, or say you were looking for people that are verified looking for OSINT, uh, something like that, you can see um, uh, the accounts that are verified that are posting about that topic or that keyword. Um, and I thought that was good. And then uh, also just his previous blog post, the best Twitter search tricks, I thought that was a uh, um, that's always a good one to take a look at and uh, nice little visual there, lots of color. Um, but yeah, so I thought that was a uh, one to highlight. Excellent. Thanks, Ritu. And it was very apropos with uh, the verified accounts uh, being uh, hijacked, let's just put it that way, uh, recently with the, uh, in the problems that Twitter was having. So very, very good. Thank you. And now over to image verification tradecraft. Matthias? Well, not so much image verification tradecraft. Uh, what I thought was interesting in this article, and it, it's French, so if you can open the article, is we spoke about misinformation, disinformation, fake news before. So when we Google something, when we see media content, 
um, sometimes we don't know where this comes from. And this was a very interesting example of this, this guy, I think on Instagram or Facebook, um, who actually uh, was posting content on his cigar company or something like that. And it looked like a, a genuine media article um, but if you scroll down, um, you'll see that this actually comes from a site that, that posts it on the American Reporter, which sounds like media, right? And if you go to that page, you can pay, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars and have your article placed there. So this is just one example. When you're looking into to press and media, um, just always look uh, at the, the actual um, source of this. So who is putting this out? Because it could be a company press release. It could be something like this that someone paid a couple hundred dollars to make it look like an official press release. And in this case, this company doesn't exist. It's just this guy kind of showing off that he has this big cigar company and a lot of money. And he tries to back that up with more or less official looking press, uh, press releases. So especially in the context of misinformation and disinformation, look at the sources. Because you well, can't pay it, for this. Is it even missing disinformation or just advertising and marketing, right? I mean, where's it could be that? both. It, it could be both. Drawn. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Laurent, you said that Telegram's got an update. Is that right? Yeah. So this is this came out uh, today. So earlier when I checked on my Telegram accounts, I saw the new update, and I think this might be of interest to a lot of people who use Telegram on a daily basis especially the desktop version. So there are a couple of interesting features, but I think the most interesting one is the, on the desktop that you can have up to three accounts uh, linked uh, to your desktop, which makes it easier if you want to switch from one account to the other. And there are some other interesting features that I think are very attractive to certain groups um, that use Telegram for bad purposes. So, yeah. There's that multiple accounts thing you were talking about. Yeah, exactly. Very nice. All right. Well, while I've got you on the line here, you want to yeah. tell us about this uh, Digicam or is that Matthias? I think it was you, right? No, that was me. Um, but I'm sure Matthias has seen the same. So basically a tweet uh, I came across by uh, Ed Bibken and it was talking about the latest version of a photo management tool. And it has certainly, uh, or it is, um, or he says that it has uh, improved facial recognition capabilities. And I also had a quick look at it. I haven't done like, a thorough test. Uh, but uh, you can download the version onto your, if you've got a Mac operating system, Windows, and I think Linux as well. And it should be apparently really good. So might be of interest to some people out there. Awesome. And they did the, the for those of you that are not watching the video, uh, they used this facial recognition tool on a dog. Yeah. Aww. <laughs> I wonder if they got consent first. I don't know. <laughs> um, Laurent. Tell yeah. us about this hacker that got fed up with Tor browser and the Tor project not updating their browser and just exactly. released, started releasing zero days. So this is very interesting. Again, this might be of interest to some people who use um, Tor on a daily basis. And uh, I came across this tweet, which um, then references this blog uh, called the Hacker Factor blog. And it is, uh, so Dr. Neil Kravitz writes the Hacker Factor blog. And on this blog, he kind of like explains that he tried to um, basically tell the Tor project that he found these vulnerabilities. And um, there are several of them, or I don't know exactly the number, but he found many zero days, um, zero days. And uh, he kind of like um, is fed up with the way his um, vulnerabilities, or they aren't really fixed. And he kind of like complains and on that tweet, so how I came across this whole thing was basically, he was basically saying that he now wants to make those uh, zero days for the Tor browser and Tor network uh, publicly available. And he's going to start making them public on his blog. So if you are working a lot um, with uh, the Tor browser, then definitely check out this blog. Yeah, I've read yeah, it because he was kind of annoyed by the way the Tor team picked up his disclosures. Right. Or yeah. they, they discounted them, right? They didn't yeah. say, oh, yeah, this is great. Yeah. Which is, which is bad for all of us because many of us rely on the Tor browser for a quick jump into Tor. And if it's not secure, then it can reveal information about our platform and all. Another reason why we use Tor on a VM or, and not on our phones. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, uh, there's a couple of conferences that are coming up that uh, I think, Ritu, you mentioned one of them here, this Australian OSINT Symposium. That's 
sponsored by uh, one of our sponsors, OSYNC Combine. You want to tell a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I saw that one show up, um, and I thought that was uh, it was kind of neat. There's three days, I believe. Um, the first day looks like it's law enforcement only, um, and then there's two more days. And Micah, I think I saw your name on there. That's it might be me, yeah. Yeah, I think it, Micah Hoffman. We'll, we'll we'll have to verify that. Um, yes. But yeah, I uh, yeah, I think this one's it seems like it's going to be a good one. Um, and it's in September, September seventh to ninth. Um, um, yeah, yeah, and and I believe there's a portion of it or all of it's free. There's I think there's a day three, where you have to pay for something. Yeah, that's that's right. That, so day one is law enforcement only. Day two mm -hmm. is open to the world. It is it is Sydney time over in Australia. So yeah. I know a lot of people are like, yeah, free OSINT online conference, and like, whoa, <laughs> I have to be up in, during the middle of the night. But it is a it is a, a got some really good content there. And then day three, OSINT Combine is doing some uh, OSINT training there. If you're interested in signing up and paying for that. Um, so thank you for bringing that up, and I'll just bring up Osmosis Con, which is a paid conference coming up later this year in October. Also, lots of OSINT information and uh, some really good stuff. I'll be talking there, too. I know that Kirby is the mistress, master of ceremonies. I'm not sure of the, the right way to say that now, but um, she is going to be um, the kind of MC for that. MC Curbster in the house. <laughs> MC Curbster, nice. That is absolutely what I'm renaming her to. Whenever we have this in the Zoom, it'll be like MC Curbster. <laughs> well, uh, we are uh, just at about our time. So um, I'd like to go ahead and thank uh, Inez again for being on the show with us and just sharing all that knowledge. Mm -hmm. I, I personally could have talked with you for another hour or two about all of your experience. It's just fascinating what you've been doing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, thank yeah. you for being here. And I'd um, like to just go around real quick and uh, we'll, I'll just call you out and say if uh, you've got anything going on that people can tune into, whether you're speaking, you got a new blog coming out, some 10 minute tips, perhaps Nick's no pressure there, big guy, but Nick, do you have anything coming up that you want to um, promote? I do. Um, I will be, like many other people, taking a short holiday and having some chill out time away from the internet. No, nah, who am I kidding? I won't be away from the internet. Um, uh, but I will be speaking at the conference that Ritu just mentioned in Australia. I won't be in Australia, unfortunately. Um, and also, I now I'm set up, I should be able to start to put together a few more 10-minute tips. And the first one I'm going to try and do is put together a short series looking at image verification and geolocation. So yeah, watch for that in September when we come back. Okay, so people could use that for like those quiz time challenges or other things? Absolutely, yeah. Awesome, and I know that you're one of those experts in that field, so thank you, We I look forward to learning from you. How about a uh, sector, do you have some things that you want to talk about or anything that uh, where people can find you aside from on the quiz time and your weekly medium posts? Well, I just got my break, um, so I'm slowly getting back onto the internet. I've missed a lot of news. Um, revamping a few things, and that will all be revealed. Um, probably next week, I'm going to start uh, filling my weekly newsletter again. So Yay. early August, and we're going to be back. So Matthias can finally have his Monday morning coffee <laughs> in style. Um, Besides that, um, I've been writing a lot. Um, I finally got the okay to write about a responsible disclosure, which is going to be published, uh, some other things. So I've, I've been busy in the background. Um, but, yep, it's going to be great to be back with the newsletter. Stay Excellent. tuned. I know a lot of people look forward to that. So uh, thank you for coming back from your break. Hey, Ritu, what about you? Anything upcoming on your your post or anything like on your uh, or your website or anything? Um, yes, sorry, I just had to unmute myself there. Um, uh, yeah, I have a, a blog post coming out hopefully in the next um, day or so or a couple of days. Uh, it's part two of creating research accounts for OSINT investigations. Ooh. 
So sock lots puppets, of sock puppets. Yeah, sock puppets. So a little write up on that. Um, so look out for that, and that'll be coming out shortly. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Laurent, uh, Laurent, anything? Yeah, nothing major. Um, is my day work is uh, getting uh, busier with every single day, and I have a couple of busy weeks ahead. So nothing on on that side, apart from just working and being busy. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you more on the show in September. Thank you for, for all you did to uh, line up Inez here. Inez, are there places where people can go to hear more about your wonderful work or, or to hear you talk more? Well, our disinformation on the elections and on COVID is on the university um, website that I'm pretty sure. Can they trust it? Yeah. Did they yeah. research what you've been researching to make sure? I mean, you see what I'm doing here, Nika, right? It's like, how do we trust the people that say you can trust them? Exactly, exactly. Well, you can use a VM or the Tor browser without the bridges <laughs> yet, let's hope. <laughs> but, yeah, and if you need any help on anything in Portuguese, please reach out. Don't be shy. Uh, genealogy now as well. And I mean, it was such a pleasure to be here with you guys. I also think it's uh, quite important that we start thinking about, um, how do you call like names? So I think one of the things we don't have that much in the OSINT community that I felt from different, from law enforcement is, is it a target? Is it an object? Is there a subject? We used to say selectors to like phone and like email. And then we had contextual selectors for like um, place of living. But I mean, that would be my like names. I think it's important that we start like trying to think about a manual where we all speak kind of like the same language. That would be like my tip, or at least to leave you to think about it on the holidays. So yeah, maybe that would be an interesting project where we all kind of get together and name things and that we all use the same like code language. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so it's interesting you brought that up, and I'm probably way premature to, in announcing this, but one of the things that us OSINT Curious people have been talking about is a centralized open source methodology for open source intelligence. And one of those pieces of that will be common terminologies and definitions. Yeah. So um, not saying that everybody would use it, not saying, you know, it would be a community built thing that we will we will start. So I think during the next month or so, we're going to be working on that. So stay tuned. So Great. I would look forward to your, uh, your input there. Thank you. Cool. Nico, what do you have to say, sir? Um, got some classes for SEC for eight, seven cents coming up, some workshops coming up later this year. And I'm currently working on a handful of talks for conferences on closed ones, which I hope to make publicly available a little bit later this year. Awesome. So. Cool. Thank you, sir. And Matthias. So the German OSIN conference is planning on putting out a series of podcasts. Um, it will be in German, unfortunately, but we're going to get some of the, the great OSIN experts uh, from Germany talk about what they do and how they do it. And I just want to say thank you, Sector, for putting out your newsletter next Monday again, because I completely lose track of time, especially during the COVID period. So your newsletter tells me it's the start of a new week. So, so please do that on Sunday again and put it out for Monday morning. <laughs> Telling time by Sector 035's blog yeah. post. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Great. Thank you, Matthias. And I, Michael Hoffman, have a couple of OSINT classes coming up, a bunch of talks coming out too. Lots of fun stuff on OSINT Curious. And I am just thrilled to be here with my friends, and Inez, who I hope is my friend now too, uh, from being on the show. Oh, that's terrific. And thank you to our amazing audience for being there. And thank you to all of our listeners. Um, and sponsors and patrons, we will see you in a little bit over one month. Um, everybody, I guess there's one just last thing to say, right? Stay, Stay awesome. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.